I'm really looking forward to what we're able to do next year. It's going to be a great year for us all. But the other thing I wanted to point out is that we're not the only people having a 10-year anniversary. There are quite a few organizations that are celebrating this particular milestone. And Lindsay Smalling, our curator at SOCAP and the content producer, our producer, is going to bring, come out to the stage with some folks from other organizations that are also celebrating 10-year anniversaries to talk about what that has been like for, in their organizations as well. So, Lindsay. Good morning, everyone. So with the 10 year anniversary, it sort of caught us by surprise a little bit. And as we started looking around, we realized that 10 years ago was a pretty special time in this field when there were actually a lot of organizations that got started. And these amazing folks that are sitting up here with me today are some pretty heavy hitters in terms of what's been done in this field in the last 10 years. So I'm really excited for this conversation. Not so much to look back on what the last 10 years had, but to look forward from these folks who have been doing this for 10 years and say what's really coming for this field as we all sit here today and get really excited about moving forward. So I actually want to start with you, Patricia, and ask when you started Veris, you were obviously replying to a demand from clients to align their assets with their money. How did those conversations look then and how are they really different and starting potentially in a different place now? So 10 years ago, I just I want to do a, a quick step back, just beyond 10 years, is because is, I've been in the industry for 25 years, and I really want to, when I came into the industry 25 years ago, they were already pioneers that were doing socially responsible investing, and we really stand on their shoulders, and so it's really want to honor them for many people that are new to impact investing, and, and impact investing was one of the three pillars of socially responsible investing. So there was impact investing, there was shareholder activism, and then there was uh, screening around environmental and social issues. And so it was at that 10-year period where impact really became elevated. And I think what really was, was key, what was a big transition, how I talk about it or think about it, it was really the transition of like, now is the time to be solutions-oriented. And so when we look at our clients at our t that time, the clients that we started Veris with, many of them were very progressive politically. And I think one of the myths people often think about impact investing is they weren't young. They were, most of them were either my age or older than me. They were white identified. Um, most of the people <clears throat> in the industry working in the industry were white identified. The, the, demo, the geographic demographics were um, New York, Atlantic Coast, New England, California, of co course. Um, and then when you look at the thematic areas that they were interested in, social justice and environmental justice were really, really key. And so um, I think what happened in, at that moment in time, we attracted a lot of clients when we first launched. And then, um, and at that time, the Monetary Institute report was coming out, B-Lab was launching, and the financial crisis happened. So that all, ha that's the other thing that happened at this 10-year <laughs> anniversary. I don't know if everybody remembers that, but it's pretty key. And so, really, that, that, that both froze people for a while, and then coming out of that, I think people felt, they started looking at their portfolio and saying what really is in this portfolio in a different way, how can it be used, how can capital be used to have even more impact, to provide solutions. And so our clients today, from a thematic point of view, it's, it's, it's beyond the broad umbrellas of environmental, social, and governance issues, and it's really very, um, many thematic issues. So if you even look at community wealth building or community wealth development, within that, within that you have housing, you have issues of working around race, of inclusion. So our clients are driven to us you know, by specific thematic areas, sustainable agriculture, regenerative agriculture. Our clients are leading us to the next opportunities. And I think that's what another thing that's really changed where we were in a period where we were convincing people to do environmental social governance investing, to do impact investing, to do shareholder engagement. And now we have clients, more and more clients coming to us 
challenging us. Our clients are experts in those fields. They lead us to what the next, the next area, thematic area that we're going to work on. And then we're constantly challenged of how do we actually create this and make this happen. So I think that the demographics, when you look at it, are from a geographic point, point of view, are changing some. I think one of the issues that we have, um, and we'll t I'll talk a little bit more later about it, but we're still pretty, as far as the investors go and the clients, white identified. We're seeing many more foundations come into uh, the fold. We're really seeing that explode thanks to organizations like Mission Investors Exchange and Confluence Philanthropy, where before you were really trying to convince foundations to do this. Now they're not only taking the lead in regards to more and more foundations coming into the fold, but they're taking the lead on the impact areas where they really want to see capital yeah. deployed. So you're really seeing a more innovative, more client-driven demand on not just wanting product, but wanting to go deep in the thematic areas. That's great, yeah. And I wonder too, so Bart, you work with a lot of companies, which is sort of a different part of the field, but I wonder if you're maybe seeing, you know, you're sort of nodding your head as Patricia's indicating some of these changes. How is that changing also in the group you work with? Sure, so uh, certainly, Lindsay, when we began, uh, we were speaking to the true believers, right? If I go back 10 years and uh, think about uh, where B-Lab sat at its inception, uh, this was about leadership and trying to find those organizations who for decades had been leading uh, this field of CSR, sustainability, social enterprise, yeah. choose your, your terminology. And, and for that community, what we offered was a certification, right? A platform for them to have a voice bigger than themselves. And the truth is, that leadership group, we still talk to them the same way, right? That certification has just scaled over the last decade, where we now have about 2,300 certified B corporations in uh, 54 countries. What's been interesting is that with the development of that community, it's all the folks who now want to be like a B Corp. Mm -hmm. And what we've had to offer to meet them where they are. Because they often show up with, hey, listen, I heard that uh, Natura in Brazil was a B Corps, or a Tritos Bank in Amsterdam, or Patagonia. And you know, what does that mean? And for those organizations, we need to change the way we approach them and meet them where they are and help them along this journey, help them up the mountain. And so we've been working to try to develop a couple of tools that do exactly that, one of, uh, one of which is our impact assessment, right? We have a, a tool we use for certification. We've had to make that fun, easy to use, contagious, yeah. so that people can engage. Uh, we now have about 65,000 companies using that platform, just as kind of a do-it-yourself free consulting tool to know where to begin, to figure out the road to using their business as a force for good. Similarly, uh, as you know, part of our work is around trying to create governance structures that will allow you to align your governance with your mission. And early on, you know, we had people jumping into these governance structures without really understanding mm -hmm. uh, exactly what it meant, truthfully. And over the course of the decade, we've been able to pass some legislation here in the states, in 35 states, and it's moving forward in 11 other countries. And we now see more and more companies showing up without an interest in the certification, or an interest, frankly, in the impact measurement tool, they simply want to make sure that their mission is preserved long term, Never. and they use our governance structure. And so we have about 6,000 companies now using the benefit core structure across the globe. And so it, it is both the who and the what that yep. has changed over the last decade. That's great. Yeah, and then Giselle, I want to ask, so Patricia mentioned the monitor report. And I think at that moment, 10 years ago, that report really catalyzed a lot of this field. And the GIN took up so many of those initiatives to build the infrastructure for this field, take the recommendations in that report, and move forward. Now that we're sort of 10 years in and there's been so much progress made on so many of these, where, do you, where are you looking for sort of the critical role for GIN to play going forward and, and the infrastructure we still need to build? Great, and in the spirit of looking forward, I'll start by just sharing or painting what the future looks like, and that's the future that we're all striving to achieve with in building impact investing. So this is a future where it is no longer acceptable 
to make investments without regard for the environment, for society, where we're all making investments by paying attention to long-term performance, and where the transparency in the transaction is such that investors are readily able to understand and consider the positive and social, um, positive and negative non-financial impact of the choices. And we're really taking into consideration risk, return, impact equally well in standard financial theory. And this is a future where we have all kinds of products. Hello, okay. And this is a future where we have products available for all types of investors so that they are allocating a portion of the assets to this important uh, strategy of investing. So, so this is a future where because of the way we allocate assets, we wake up every day future generations to a healthy planet, to an equitable society. Now the question is how to go from here to there. We've made tremendous progress in three main areas of work outlined in the Monitor Report, in building efficient intermediaries to unlock capital, in building enabling infrastructure, and also in increasing the absorptive capacity of social enterprises. And all of this is thanks to the effort of all of you in this room. And the GIN is very proud to have contributed to the effort, including in creating the largest global community of impact investors with 250 members in 30 plus countries. There's so much more that we need to do. We're now in the middle of a, the, one of the largest global stakeholder consultation to develop a 10 to 15 year strategic roadmap for the impact investing industry. The report will come out in early next year, but I'll just tell and share you know, what we know about three things that just need to happen. One, we need to make impact measurement and management easy to do and easy to understand. We have to develop incentives while removing barriers to impact investing. So this can be tying compensation to impact um, or producing, developing products that meet investor needs and investee needs. And last but not least, we need to increase the clarity around what an impact investment is to really maintain the integrity of the practice, as well as increasing the clarity of the importance of making impact investments across the risk and return spectrum. So I'll just close by saying that we need trillions of dollars if we're really gonna address all the challenges outlined and the aspirations outlined in the sustainable development goals. And we really need to scale this practice. So that with the GIN, we're committed to developing the infrastructure and tools that I mentioned, as well as uh, actively uh, bringing new investors, especially large institutional asset owners, and help move them in this journey of participating in impact investing. That's great, yeah. And I mean, those are some pretty big shifts that I think we're already starting to really see with some really large mainstream financial players sort of entering this space, which is great because that has to happen for, this, for us to reach that scale. But I'd ask Patricia, you know, how does that change the position of Veris and sort of how Veris's longstanding role in guiding clients in this way in sort of a changing financial advisory landscape overall? What does that look as we try to look like as we try to move all this capital? Well, ideally, I mean, I, I, we're very excited about the growth of the industry and the mainstreaming of the industry. I think what we bring is, to, what Averis brings is a firm that the individuals in the firm, our clients, we're very committed to all of these issues. We're independent. We want to stay independent. And if, if as best we can as in, independent, so we're focused on our mission of growing impact investors and having positive impact. So I really think what differentiates us is getting, continuing to be smarter, to get better at what we're doing already, to be looking at the issues and staying on top of it. I think that the future impact advisor needs to really be able to integrate and clearly integrate and understand the issues of finance, of capital, how capital could be used differently, and the issues that we're working on. And I think that that's gonna require, I think that the impact advisor is gonna become 
a field of its own, a designation, a career that is going to be different than what it is today, and that there will really need to be the rigor and understanding of the issues that we're trying to solve. I think the other thing that we're really going to want to see, as I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, I mean, the going forward, I mean, which is fantastic, we're really seeing more and more women, millennials, younger people driving this, driving the innovation. We want to be able to build ways of communicating faster with women, more information, because they ask more questions, they're more inquisitive. Our new investor knows more about investing and impact investing than yesterday's SRI client, much more. One of the things I would really like to see, we're seeing, you know, focus on work of advisors, having more women advisors, we're doing well there. In our firm, you know, six of our eight wealth managers are women. Seeing more uh, people of color and women have ownership of capital firms that are placing capital, but what not what we are not seeing yet, I think, is where what are we doing about we're seeing more focus on the investor base being women. How are we working towards that investor base and bringing them in? They'll be there, but how are we including more people of color in the investor base? Because women and people of color coming in is going to change the way we look at capital and how it's deployed because their relationship with the capital markets has been, is very different than the current relationship with capital markets. So we need to be innovative and open, and I think that's what's gonna differentiate us, is we're gonna be looking constantly forward is how do we have the most impact, and how do we integrate that with capital in a way that is going to meet the needs of the communities and have the communities leading the direction that we're going. That's awesome. And I think, you know, Bart, you've mentioned some of this as well to me is that uh, that these com the, the community really is changing. You sort of said it in your earlier comments too. And when you talk to these business leaders, how are they sort of preparing for the future? How are they staying ahead and responding to the different needs of their employees, the different needs of their clients? What does that look like for business leaders? So I, I do think, uh, I'm so glad you brought up um, the 2008 financial crisis. Because I, I think it's important, as we also look, look forward, to recognize that the 2008 financial crisis, truthfully, was a gift to this community. <laughs> Honest to God, right? It changed the narrative to talk about companies with higher standards of transparency, accountability, and purpose became no longer fringe. And so it, for B-Lab, it, believe it or not, was an accelerating moment. I think, Lindsay, we're at another historic moment that this room should honestly capitalize on. Because I would tell you, in our interaction, we're an apolitical organization. We are neither left nor right. When we work with legislators, the commonality that we find over and over again is they all believe that business can play a larger role in solving the great challenges in front of us. And so I do think, despite uh, the chaos that is swirling around all of us, there is a silver lining, and the silver lining is but we are seeing a surge, an absolute surge of interest from leaders who want to have a platform, who want to have the ability to influence the greater good. And so uh, right now, uh, we're super excited about what we've seen from uh, uh, leaders across the globe about wanting to engage and fill the void. So that's one. Secondly, uh, you also mentioned millennials. What we're finding, that interest is not only because of their uh, desire to lead, but also, frankly, a bit uh, responding to their employees, to their staffing. What millennials expect from work is very different than what the vast majority of this room expected when you graduated from college. They expect both money and meaning from their jobs. Mm -hmm. And so there is an absolute surge we're seeing from uh, millennials looking for organizations that are values aligned, which increases attraction and retention for those corporations. Uh, finally, I, I'm glad you mentioned the SDGs, because if, if I look more broadly at what could harmonize all of our efforts, there seems to be, I, I can't be in a room where people don't talk about you know, how they relate back to the SDGs. And so we have all been looking forever for that 
right? What is the backbone? What is the centerpiece upon which we can all rally around? Mm -hmm. We are currently mapping our, our uh, impact assessment to the SDGs. It seems to be a common theme across the, the front. We're working with the UNGC on that um, to de deliver something that allows companies to manage, assess, and improve yeah. on the SDGs. And so I, I do think there is a, a thread moving forward that we can use through a common platform. That's great. And Gisela, sort of on this same line, you know, it does feel like the time is now. It always feels like the time is now, though. That's what it felt like 10 years ago, and it feels really like more needed now than ever. What is, from the Jin's perspective, sort of unique about this time, and let's rally this crowd to m get this moving? Yeah, sure. And you're right. I mean, the, the, I think the, the scope and the urgency of everything that we're trying to solve for is, has always maintained the same, but I would say what is indisputable now, and, and Bart, you mentioned this historic moment, is we can no longer say that we, and I don't mean folks, only folks in this room, but our collective we, that we're unaware of all these vast challenges influencing and affecting the communities, be it in our backyard or across oceans, and we can no longer say that we don't know how to mobilize all the resources that we have to do something about it. We do. We, knew, we know how to direct investments to build more affordable housing, to power rural villages with clean energy, and to increase economic well-being of smallholder farmers. So I would say, you know, what we think of is, is what um, Mark Greer, uh, the GINS chairperson, who is the vice chair uh, at Prudential Financial uh, one said that when he sees the difference between now and a decade ago, it is the idea that all the problems and the challenges facing the world are someone else's problems, that is giving way to the notion that I can do something about it too. And I can do it in a way that makes financial, financial sense. And for all of us in this room who play a role in building this impact investment movement, he also said, we have an obligation to lead because we know that it works. We know that it impacts investing works across asset classes and sectors and geographies. So I think this is a truly exciting moment to really think about, we get to do this. We get to think about how to scale capital in a way that is a powerful instrument for social good. That's awesome. So, I think that's a great note to end on. The magic of SOCAP is that we get groups like this have been around for so long, plus all of you who this is your first SOCAP, welcome. And I'm excited to be celebrating this 10-year anniversary. Congratulations to all of you on your 10-year anniversary. Um, thank you. Let's give everyone a round of applause.